Okay, hi everybody. Uh, hey, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, you're a star. Um, all right, uh, so uh, we go on to our next uh, session, which is a keynote uh, from uh, David Ford. Um, so I'll just do a very quick introduction and then we'll get going. Um, I guess we may, may slightly run over the, the, the time now. Um, David Ford um, is the founder of Expert Link, um, which is a peer led network which aims to amplify the voices and share the experiences of people marginalized by severe and multiple disadvantage. Expert Link seeks to influence national and local policy and to provide smart solutions to make support services better. David has lived experience of homelessness and has authored, co-authored and contributed to numerous reports and publications. Um, so if you could join me in welcoming uh, David Ford. Uh, thank you very much. Do you know, I brought a prop with me today. And, uh, do you know what, Owen, I thought for a moment I was going to have to have to use it, can of special brew, um, with that not working and stuff. Hi, uh, do you all enjoy this morning, all had enough lunch and excellent. Um, so uh, I wanna, I'm going to talk a little bit about homelessness and, uh, and stuff, and, and, uh, but I want to bring in some of the stuff that we've mentioned this morning, uh, I think it's Julia and there's Emma, you mentioned some uh, stuff as well, if I can, into to what we're talking about, which is, uh, of course, um, uh, representation of homelessness and so one of the things is that homelessness never happens on its own does it it's not a singular thing and yet often that's what we talk about as one thing isn't it and um, if you look at multiple disadvantage which is uh, homelessness substance and alcohol misuse um, the, the criminal justice system mental illness victims of domestic violence and abuse when we talk about that and how it's represented in the media, um, what we get is, is actually um, homelessness is only talked about 9% of the time. So um, here you go. Oh. Our analysis shows how the perspective of people who are poor and or homeless are particularly absent from any media of coverage. They talk about the crime though, don't they? They talk about all the bad stuff, the crappy bits. But they don't talk possibly about the homelessness and actually and poverty, which if you look at all of the other things, what's the common denominator? Poverty. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I just want to bring us, by the way, this is um, from a report that uh, hasn't come out yet. So um, <laughs> there you go. We've got some stuff. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, talk about my story a little bit. Uh, um, so uh, and like all stories, we have to start from the beginning. So, um, we just won the, uh, anyone here into cricket? I know if John was here from, uh, he's into a big style, uh, to, but John Kirk from the government is into, he's here tomorrow I think, isn't he? He's, he's here. Yeah, yeah, he's here tomorrow, he's a big, big cricket fan. And, um, but, so I was born back in 1966, the other big game in England is football, isn't it? Yeah. And 1966, England won the World Cup, did they not? Absolutely fantastic, and it was um, it was a time when um, uh, there was uh, there was lots of like the, the Beatles were up and coming. Music was changing, wasn't it? Um, there was lots of hippie stuff and that flower power, you know, love and you know psychedelic sort of thing going on. Wasn't there? Great, wonderful time. But actually, it was a time when um, uh, if you were born and you were born out of wedlock, I mean, without your parents being married, um, that was not good. And what tended to happen is um, uh, kids went into care. Uh, that would be me too. And a lot of the stories that you might have seen in the press over, over time, um, uh, they're genuine. A lot of them are really, really genuine about the horrendous things that happened in the care system. So I went straight from uh, being born straight into the care system, got brought up with like 750 other kids uh, in the home that I grew up in. And I can tell you now, the abuse that as I said, you often gets reported, it was very real at that time. We had different checks and balances in place to, to make sure that kids were safe. So the, the emotional, physical and the sexual abuse was actually really rife um, in the care system at the time. So um, for me in care, it was all of that sort of stuff. And it got to a point where it was really, really bad. And at, at 14, um, uh, I was really struggling. And at 14, that was the time that I started using drugs, I picked up drugs. I started using solvents, which were the, um, the thing of the day back then, solvents and anything else I could get my hand on. And uh, that was my way of managing and coping, escaping from the trauma that I was stuck in. At 16, I left care. And um, I joined, but 
kids join gangs now. I joined the biggest gang at the time, then, and it was the British Army. And when I joined up at 16, guess what? Most of the kids care, dysfunctional families, all of that sort of stuff. And uh, I spent sort of eight years in the army, and um, uh, although, I say didn't do drugs, there was a bit of drug taking, um, uh, I walked out of the army with, uh, after two things that I'd learned, or two things that were pretty significant. The first thing is I learned how not to drink, because that's what we did. We were all chaotic. We got pissed and went out on a fight on a Friday night, Saturday night, and a Sunday night. That's how it was. Uh, and the other thing is that I went on active service. And um, so when I left the, um, left the army, by the time I'd left the army, my mental health and my mental illness couldn't have been much worse. Abused as a child, severely abused as a child, went in the army, uh, went on active service, post-traumatic stress disorder, and my head was in a real mess. So what I did is I picked up what I knew was good for me, or what I felt was good that helped me to manage that, and that was drugs. Picked up drugs again. I spent the next 18 years using, really, really badly, using drugs, um, uh, living in real chaos. Uh, and in amongst all that, all that mental illness underneath shh, the, at the bottom of it, to a point where twice in my life um, I've attempted to take my own life. Thankfully, I'm really shit at that sort of stuff, and I'm still here. And I've also learned how not to, how to manage my, my illness and, uh, and survive. So, um, but all that sort of going on, and I got caught up in lots of um, uh, criminality. Uh, I travelled the world, um, doing all sorts of bad things to do with my addiction and my trauma. Uh, and then in, in March 2000, I was on the street, I ended up on the streets, and in March 2009, um, if you give anyone to go back to March 2009, so I live in London. And uh, down in London, the southeast, we get good weather. Not like, a, you know, up north. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't look my uh, my map before I started driving up here. I thought, Lincoln? Yeah, be down the road. Um, so I live in south London, and uh, it, it's quite warm. But, but 2009, we had a really bad year. And, and it was quite uh, cold. And I woke up in a car park covered in snow. And um, with three empty cans of special brew next to me. And a really, really dry mouth, and, um, uh, and I was covered in snow. And the low point for me, ironically, was, but the low point for me was I climbed over a fence and stole some water. Got one of the empty tins, took it over to a, somebody's garden, went to the stand pot, shh, got some water to get rid of the, um, uh, the thirst. Really, really bad. And when I was out on the streets, um, I, I met some really, uh, really good, I say good, good, fantastic, incredible people. So there was three of us who stuck together as a little group. There was Jenny, um, and she won't mind me telling you this. Jenny uh, had just been um, uh, at least thrown out of a mental health institute for um, arguing with them about the medication that they, she was giving them, saying it was the wrong thing for her. And there was also a guy called Pat who just um, uh, came out of prison. He'd spent seven years in prison, um, was a heroin user, been in lots and lots of trouble and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, but when I met him, he said, David, um, I've got my addiction in one hand and I've got my Bible in the other. And do you know what? With this one, I'm going to beat this. I don't know if you've ever been with anyone when they've been clucking, when they're really at the, the lowest, you know, it is not a pleasant place to be. Um, uh, so I was with Pat one day and we went down to the local um, uh, drug and alcohol agency down in George Street and, we, and I, we knocked on the door, eventually got in to see a support worker and we sat there and uh, Pat couldn't communicate on his own. He's in a terrible state, so I'm communicating for him and we're having this conversation. And uh, the support worker, after about 10 minutes, turned around and went, but you're homeless too. And I went, yeah. What happened to the conversation? Stopped. Dead. Doof. End of conversation. There you go, there's the door, on your way. We're not listening to another homeless person, so I, I went out. I went down to the council. Um, uh, I went down to the council not long afterwards and turned up and said, so in the morning I waking up, I called, I said, can, I, can you help me? And uh, they turned around and said, well, actually, no, we can't help you. You know, you're, you're in your 40s, you're going to sort yourself out, we haven't got the accommodation. So, um, but that's the sort of, ch that's where things started to change for me. So who's been in the back of one of those? Actually, they've changed now, haven't they? Um, what, used, what they used to do when you used to get in a police car is they'd open the door and they'd do that for you, get in, so you didn't bang your head. Very nice, really cool. They've got vans now, so you can always tell someone who's been thrown in the back of a van because they've got marks on their shins. <laughs> Terrible. Um, 
So uh, there, I was told a wonderful story by um, uh, the ex-chief exec of, of Homeless Link. She went on to be um, the oh time. Uh, she went on to be the chief exec of uh, the Mental Health Foundation, and we were working together doing some consultancy. And she did some research down at the passage, and she got talking to one of the girls down there. And this is the girl's story. So this girl used to she used to graft, which means she used to serve up did drugs. That's how she made her living. And she used to do it down on the London Underground because you can disappear into the crowds. But they've got all the CV, CCTV stuff up now, haven't they? And the police don't wear uniforms, so you can't see them coming up behind you. So she's working away there. And all of a sudden, poof, they catch her. Cuffed her up, dragged her up in front of her and all that, shut the escalator, and chucked her in the back of the van and took her down there, or back of the police car, or whatever it was the car, I think it was then, and then took her to the um, police station. So if you've ever been checked in at a police station, checked in, sounds nice, doesn't it? If you've ever been checked in at a police station, actually, the desk sergeants are really well trained because they don't want you kicking off. That's the last thing they want. So they are really, really, really nice. You know, as best as they can be. So this young girl had been doing all the drugs and they caught, she was about this big, you know, and you looked at her and butter wouldn't melt in her mouth and they were checking her in and all the rest of the stuff and this angelic little thing here uh, and, you know, she, uh, you've done this, that and the other and yada, yada, yada. And, and um, they turned their back on her and she went for the door, she went to escape and on the way out what she did is the guy who brought her in had left the police car keys on the desk. So she swiped then, got out the door, pinged the car, got in the car, pinged the front gate and got out. Poof. It took them 20 minutes to catch her. 20 minutes, how amazing. Um, so she's up in court. And um, uh, so she's in court and the judge is going like, oh, yeah, you're a thief, you're a criminal, um, you stole a police car, you've done this. If you ever do anything, by, by the way, if you ever do anything against the police, expect the worst. Because they were giving everything at her. And, uh, so they threw the book at her. Chucked her into, magistrates chucked her into a prisoner sentence or whatever and give her the, uh, the most that they could give her. But his thing stopped for a minute. They labour of all of these things as criminals, as a, you know, murderer, thief, all the rest of it. But she was much more than that, wasn't she? This is, forget the behaviour, as a woman she was absolutely incredible, wasn't she? She had her own business, she's an entrepreneur. Might not be in the right industry, but she had entrepreneurial skills, did she not? And not only that, she's got her own business in a male-dominated industry. I know, because I was in it. A male-dominated industry that is controlled through fear. And that fear is instilled through violence. And she had her own business. Phew, some ballsy woman, wasn't that? Hey, how amazing was that? And she then had the gumption and the creativeness to get out of the police station and nick a police car. I'd work for her, maybe not in the industry, but hey, this is some seriously entrepreneurial woman, isn't it? But no one mentioned that, not one person mentioned that. All they did is said, you're a thief, you're a, you're a murderer because you're selling drugs, you stole a police car. And nobody looked at the skills. So um, I've been down to the council and said to the council, uh, there we go. I went down to the council and um, uh, turned around to the council and said, can you help me? And they said no. And I was back on the streets and I spoke to my community and they said, do you know what you want to do, David? This is how you go down to the council. The council didn't tell me how to, or no one in the services told me how to get support. The guys on the streets told me. So go down to the council and tell them that you were in the care system. Go and tell them the abuse that you suffered. Go and tell them about your mental health and the medication that you're on. Go and tell them about the drug stuff that you've had. Go and tell them all the shit things about yourself. And guess what? You might just get some help. So um, I ended up in a, in a hostel not long after. And um, I was really, really angry when I got into my hostel and I thought, this ain't going to happen again. This ain't going to happen to me again when I turn up with somebody at um, drug and alcohol services and say, sorry, you can't help. No one's going to turn around to me and say that I can't help my community because I'm not qualified. So the first thing I did, because you could then, I signed up to college. And I went and got my um, uh, advice and guidance um, certificates and my support service certificates. And I went to Pret-a-Manger. And for four years at Pret-a-Manger, Thursday morning, 9 o'clock, Croydon High Street, 
Doof. Advice for the people, by the people, screw the system. And, and that's how we worked. And I had people coming from all over the place, coming down, because it was us helping ourselves. Uh, there was a time, actually, where if anyone's in recovery here, um, you heard of Smart Recovery. Um, Smart Recovery had just come down. Hamish had brought it down from the prisons of Scotland. Uh, and it was very much a grass movement sort of recovery uh, thing. A bit like um, AA and stuff, a self-help peer-led group. Uh, and I sort of set that up for the South East. Um, I then went and got involved with, again, with this woman called uh, Jenny Edwards from Homeless Link. Um, uh, so I got involved with her and we set up an advisory panel which was genuinely, uh, genuine people who'd, who'd uh, experienced or were experienced homelessness, um, or experienced homelessness or were experienced homelessness, uh, and we were advising their policy team. For those of you who don't know about homeless things, what they do is they get paid by the government to advise the government. Uh, and so we had a policy, we had a bunch of us guys who were advising their policy team. And it was a really, it started in 2009, 2010. And um, uh, I chaired it for about three or four years. And do you know, I have to say that one of the things that we did as a community that's lived experience, we stopped some of the stuff that was happening in, in the welfare reform from 2010 onwards. One of the things that you may have heard of, what they wanted to do was they wanted to reduce people's benefits by 10% every year. We stopped that. Um, Lord Freud himself wouldn't actually meet with me, but <laughs> we managed to put enough pressure on there with other to stop that from happening. Um, so uh, I then want to set up, I'm still doing this, and I then want to set up a day centre called The Well. Is anyone here involved in day centres, by the way? No. Uh, I want to set up a, a day centre called The um, Well with a guy called Roger Batt, who's a major in the Salvation Army. I'm not a religious person, uh, by any means, or oh, any stretch of the imagination. But uh, that the Salvation Army wanted to do something, I wanted to do something, and so we set up a thing called The Well in Croydon, which is day centre. It's only open on a Monday, um, but you can pitch up in whatever state you are, and you'll get the, the help and support that you need. So we had the job centre pitch up down there, we did the nurses pitch up, um, we had the drug and alcohol services, all sorts of things going on. So we did that. Um, I did a load of training and consultancy work um, uh, around uh, the country, quite a lot of it. And it was a, this is the very start, guys, of when the lived experience started to get heard, and we talked about co-production and getting our voices out there uh, and into the, into the projects. Uh, and then um, I ran a project for two years um, I did uh, in Croydon. They employed me as a consultant on, on the condition was that um, they'd pay me to do the consultancy work. If I screwed it up, they'd just go, he's a consultant <laughs> and stop paying me. But what I did was my job was, was to engage with all the people that weren't engaging with services. And over two years, we engaged with 200 people. That's his lived experience engaging with those who were living the experience, who wouldn't engage with services because of whatever experience they've had with services, whatever that was, you know? Uh, and often it was negative. So we did that for two years, and we, just short of two years, and we, we worked with over 200 people. And I, um, Queen Council are very proud of the fact that actually, we know for a fact there, there was at least one person's life that we saved. It was a female uh, who we managed to get out of a squat. Um, did a bit of motivational, Motivational speaking. Are um, Lankelly Chase in the room? There will be tomorrow. Um, anyone know Hard Edges? Heard of Hard Edges? Yeah? We should all know Hard Edges. The Scottish one has just been released. Um, uh, uh, what it does, it maps out severe multiple disadvantage. Uh, uh, this one in England, but that's the one in, for Scotland as well. And what it looked at was um, uh, where severe multiple disadvantage is, is around the country. Often it's called now multiple disadvantage. Lan Kelly Chase are the lead um, foundation, if you like, in this sort of work. They started calling it severe multiple disadvantage. They downgraded it to multiple disadvantage. And when I was sat with their chief ex uh, exec, uh, Julian, and he was talking about it being multiple disadvantage, I said, well, fuck me. When I, when I was there, it was definitely severe, trust me. So it needs to be severe multiple disadvantage. Um, so. Uh, we went out and did the, the research for Hard Edge, and it maps it out across the country. And um, uh, uh, what the system was saying, and what they were looking at, are those four disciplines, homelessness, or four areas, homelessness, um, uh, mental illness, criminal justice system, and um, uh, mental health. Did I mention that? Those, those, uh, but it was only those four things. And when I went out and started doing the research, it was really, really obvious, I mean, extremely obvious, that um, domestic violence and abuse 
was right in the middle of all of that. So we then got that included. This is, off the, this is peer research for you. And then what ha what's happened, there was some more research done off the back of that, and now they are looking at the doctor's curriculum to change the doctor's curriculum to include how do you look at uh, childhood abuse and all that sort of stuff, which is amazing. Um, last year I went to, so I've been, this, um, it's great, because this is very much an international group, isn't it? We've got Poland in today, tomorrow. Are we Poland in today, tomorrow? Poland, there we go. Um, my other half's Polish. I'd like to say hello in Polish, but... It's really difficult to learn. Um, so uh, I, I was in Wasson Island last year and I, I was with uh, apparently the top 30 most active systems change people on the planet. And by the way, the stuff they're talking about, the environment and biodiversity, I heard it last year from some professors and we're not in a good place. Um, but there's all these wonderful people doing, and me. They were all, by the way, they're all doctors and professors and academics, and me. Um, and this year, uh, I went to um, Bratislava as part of a contingent for CR0. Um, I, I was in Bratislava talking about um, uh, love and compassion as it happens and about our system and the way that it works and stuff like that. And um, there's a part of a, a European campaign um, to do stuff. Uh, I sit on a whole bunch of influencing groups, one of them being the LA, LEX Elders, and, uh, of which I'm a founder member. Uh, and that's just coming out now. I recommend that you look at LEX Movement. It's lived experience and what we're doing there. It's funded by the, by the National Lottery. Um, I sat on a board at Thamesreach and we now got onto ExpertLink. I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you all of this in a minute. Um, about three years ago, um, Lan Kelly Chase came to me, well, but longer than three years ago, they came to me and said, David, um, can you do something? I was sat on a lawn, um, on a lawn at one of their positive change networks. And I was sat with one of the directors and Lan Kelly Chase back in the early days were going, we're going to change the system. And, how could you not applaud that? That's fantastic. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this. And I turned around to them and said, but it's not going to work. What? But we've got millions and millions of pounds and we're going to change the system. I said, yeah, but you're all looking at it from an academic point of view. And you're going to try and change the system from over there. Actually, by the time it gets to my guys on the street, we'll know nothing about that. What you want to do, if you genuinely want to change the system, what you need to do is get people with lived experience involved straight away and get them pushing from this bit, and you can push from that bit, and hopefully we'll meet in the middle and things will get, get changed. So we did, we set up Expert Link, and I went around the country and I uh, directly or indirectly spoke to 4,700 people. And what we've ended up with is a couple of courses. The first one called Being the Difference, which t teaches people how to give and receive feedback. Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, it, 10 minutes, yeah. Um, it, talk, it teaches people to get past the 10 minutes, uh, it teaches people how to get past, to look at those incredible skills that they have, you know, um, and we talk about, actually, your behaviour might have been really, really crap, but what skills did you use, and what did you need, and what can we do with those? How can we make your life and our world a better place? Um, we teach people how to work out what it is that they want to ask for, because often what happens is we go, I want, don't we? That's what I used to do, I want. So we take a, um, an ask and we, we just thought, how, why, what, where, when, all that sort of jazz. And then we add it to, uh, attach it to our senses. And then we start talking about, okay, well, who, who benefits from this? And then we attack, bring it back to our emotions to help people work out what they want to ask for. And then we do some facilitator training. Uh, we do it as in, for individuals, but it's, it's about group stuff. It's about co-production. And one of the things that, in fact, let me just tell you about this one first. Um, and we've got following course which is making the difference and it's looking at people's values and purpose uh, who they are and how to get what they want and we do it as individuals and for groups so we have all sorts of people turn up on this and I know that there's a challenge for the government or we challenge government often um, but the government have pitched up on our courses and one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen it we had um, we had a I can't tell you his name, a guy from the, uh, the ministry, um, a high flyer, uh, on the course, and it's this guy called Ozzy. Now, Ozzy had walked, fucking walked from North Africa to London. Do you know? And he got to London, and he was on the streets, and he's like, health, mental health, poof, shot to pieces. But he got into accommodation and got himself sorting all the rest of the bits and pieces, and he was on the course, and I budded these two up. 
And uh, 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 I nearly said a name then, didn't I? <laughs> this guy from the government turned around and said, this guy from the government turned around and said, well, this is absolutely fantastic. I love this. And I've never, you know, uh, spent my time with people like this before, and yada, yada, yada. And we're definitely going to get the people involved in our policy stuff. But do you know what was really beautiful? Is all he turned around and said, cool. They're human beings too, aren't they? <laughs> That's about people working together. Amazing. We've, off the back of our course, we've had people go into work. We've had um, uh, people t t volunteering. We've had a couple of books written, and one was published. Somebody sent me an email a week after the course, said, David, I'm going to write a book. So we had this often, and yeah, OK. My expectation was where it was, you know. Um, uh, so a week afterwards, I sent me another email. I've written the book. <laughs> I'm going to publish it. And it was, we, she put it on Lulu and it was sold out. And it's called the um, Stepping Out of the Circle, which is from The Incredible You. So I'm getting up towards the end. I want to leave you with a gift. I've got for, uh, a couple of minutes. I want to leave you with a gift. So well, why have I been telling you? I'm not very good at telling my story, to be, uh, to be fair. Uh, and I'm not comfortable, like a lot of people not comfortable about talking about our own um, good stuff. We're really good at talking about the crap stuff, aren't we? But we're don't, not very good at talking about the good stuff about ourselves. That's true though, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I find it quite difficult. Um, but I want to leave you with a, with a gift, um, or I'll leave you with something. So here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> knowing that what we all look at the people and we all look at the negative stuff, we do it about ourselves. And when we see stuff, you know, we see a can of special brew uh, and we just assume don't we we just make those judgment calls don't we must be an alcoholic well actually i'm an ex-drug addict it wasn't alcohol that did me i was using that because it was fucking cold <laughs> there's also a bit of trauma going on inside but you know but we made those assumptions don't we absolutely so what ha what would happen what would happen if we stopped doing that, if actually we came from, rather than data and processing system that we've got, came through from a place of lo genuine love and compassion. The same sort of love and compassion that you have for your next of kin, for your mums, your dads, your brothers, your sisters, and came from there. Would we not look past that? I'm fucking sure we would. And would we not be looking for the good things about people? We would, wouldn't we? And yet we have a system that focuses on all the bad stuff. Thank you.